Hello, young people of the internet. Welcome to another episode of the Bill of Rights Institute Bright and Early History and Civics web series, um, where we're talking about current events and how they relate to historical content and context and some activities for you to do at home um, or with your small community that you're in right now. So with me, I have my colleagues as always, Gary and Kirk. Hi, guys. Hello. How are you? So as we start off every episode, how are you doing? What's been going on? You know, uh, it, it's getting a little bit, a little more used to being home. Still don't know what the future will bring, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm increasingly eager to look at the news in terms of what, what will happen in the future, you know, rather than, at first it was like, what's happening now? And I'm starting to get the idea of what's happening now. So it's more of what, what do I think is going to happen? And that's been really intriguing. How about you? Paul? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you there, Gary. I feel like we're we're getting to a point where we kind of know our boundaries a little bit more, right? And and we're kind of more certain about what is uncertain, if that makes sense. And now mm -hmm. within that uncertainty, starting to think a little bit about, okay, well, what's the next phase of this going to look like? How are we all going to respond? And um, and what are things going to look like on the other side of this this crisis? Right. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that uh, that I had noticed this week was there were some big projections about um, the nature of American democracy. And that struck me because, as you all know, we're a bunch of civics and history nerds. And when people start making big predictions about what's going to happen with our democracy, I start to pay attention pretty closely. Um, two big things that happened were Bernie Sanders ended his presidential campaign, which meant that Joe Biden is going to very likely be the nominee for the presidential election that's happening in November. And then the other thing that happened is the state of um, Wisconsin held its primary, even though the state was under a stay at home order. And so there was a lot of question and contention and kind of a lot of commentary on what that meant and how you proceed with the elections in the cr cr crisis and critical moments in American history. Um, and so that was something we all were kind of chatting about. And we wanted to talk with you young people about as well, because there are a lot of implications and it's a little hard and people start making these big claims <laughs> about the nature of democracy. Paul Krugman, if you don't know, is a columnist in the New York Times. He often makes big claims, um, but uh, this one in particular, you know, that's shocking and maybe a little scary. And, and so we wanted to talk about uh, kind of what is the what is the history of elections in crisis and 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 how can we think about these? And, and even as a young person, what's your role as we're thinking about how these things are all changing very rapidly? Um, so, Kirk, you have put together a little something for us yeah. to talk about the history of elections in crisis. So. I think what's become evidently clear at this point is that I like history. Uh, and, you know, one, one reason I like history, particularly in these times, is that I, I can look back and find things that are somewhat similar, or at least a similar kind of thing to what's going on. And that can help, it at least, it comforts me to know that there's a little bit of context, that we've gone through these things before, um, and that uh, our democracy and our democratic process um, continues to function. Um, so I thought I would just touch on a couple different elections that I've been thinking about. Um, not that these elections are really similar to what's going on now, but only in the sense that they are moments that were very uncertain that Americans before us have lived through um, and that they had elections. So I picked a few out here. Um, 1860 and 1864 are around the Civil War. So lots of sectional tension questions, big questions that are being asked of the country. 1876 comes immediately after that. Um, that's dealing with Reconstruction. Um, a president had just been impeached, um, and uh, there was, I, I pointed out here on this slide, there was 81.8% voter turnout, which is pretty wow. incredible. Uh, people were very interested in the direction the country went, um, and uh, it, it came down to a very split kind of decision. So if you have some time, look into that election. It's really interesting. Um, and then three elections, 32, 40, and 44, have to deal with the Great Depression, as well as um, the Second World War. Um, and then finally, I just highlighted here 1968, because it was in the midst of a lot of um, internal political turmoil. There was turmoil at the Democratic National Convention, famously riots and protests. Um, but across the country, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, and we still had a presidential election. We still had um, elections that we went through. Um, 
So I want to touch just quickly on, on 1860 because it was a moment of sectional tension. So the South and the North were at odds with one another. And that turned into four presidential candidates. Uh, you have Abraham Lincoln and Hannibal Hamlin. Um, I think Hannibal Hamlin's name is a great trivia fact. If you ever want to surprise your, your you know, friends and family, who was Abraham Lincoln's first vice president? Um, he's an interesting guy. He's from Maine, um, but worth checking out in his own right. Uh, but then you had the Southern Democratic Party and the Democratic Party. So the Southern Dem the Democrats had two conventions that year. Um, the first one, they couldn't come to a decision. They split um, over the issue of popular sovereignty, which is the idea that individual states would be able to choose whether or not they kept slavery or not. Um, and the Southern Democrats went one way, the Democrats went the other way. Um, then you had this Constitution Party, um, which was uh, the former party of the Whigs, which is a funny name, uh, but the Southern Whigs were in coalition with the North and had concerns about the extension of slavery, uh, but ultimately um, didn't favor secession, so they formed their own party. So you have these four parties all in tension with one another. Um, and the result is the election of 1860, where Abraham Lincoln wins 39.8% of the, the vote, which isn't a whole lot if you think about it, uh, but he won 180 electoral votes, which secured for him the presidency. So 39% uh, of the popular vote and then 181 electoral votes. 180 electoral votes, yep. Yeah, 180 right. electoral votes. Um, but super high turnout again. So 81.2% voter turnout, which is really, yeah, that's wild. really yeah. high. Um, but that popular vote number is really interesting, partly because what happens immediately after this, which is the country ruptures and splits, right? Um, in the South, um, southern states secede, um, and then we enter into a period of civil war, um, which is one of the most catastrophic conflicts um, in our nation's history. Um, and in the midst of that war, we had a presidential election. Um, it's interesting to note the Confederate um, government didn't have a national election, but the North did. Um, in 1864, Abraham Lincoln found himself running against his former head general in George B. McClellan. Um, and uh, this election was very contentious, and Lincoln was not looking very good in the polls. Um, McClellan, the, McClellan was in favor of the war, but the Democratic Party itself was running on a peace platform. They thought that there'd been enough death and suffering, and they wanted to make peace with the South. Um, and Lincoln was sticking with um, the idea of pursuing the war to its end. Um, and uh, in that election, uh, there was a big moment uh, called what's now referred to in political circles as an October surprise. Sherman wins Atlanta um, and sends Lincoln this famous telegram that says Atlanta is ours and fairly won. Um, and that really swung the election in Lincoln's favor. But up until the actual election, um, it was very much um, in doubt whether or not Lincoln would continue to be president. Again, you have a really high voter turnout, which is interesting, 73.8%. The other interesting thing about this election is that Southern states... Um, weren't counted because they weren't, they were in rebellion, right? So only areas that were occupied by union troops and could put on election were able to vote. Um, but Lincoln secures the presidency. Um, and then just really quickly, another one, uh, because it was more of an economic situation, uh, the election of 1932 between Herbert Hoover and uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, um, the stock market had crashed um, in 1929 in the ensuing economic depression um, there was high unemployment. People were frustrated with uh, the way the Hoover administration had been dealing with it. Um, and so you get really a landslide um, in favor of FDR. And I think this is interesting. Hoover won 39.7% of the popular vote. In the previous election in 1928, he had had 58% of the popular vote. So there's a huge decline there that shows what happens when American people are thinking about um, who it is that they want leading them and when they get frustrated um, with who's in charge. Um, and um, I was going to touch on the wartime election. Same kind of thing happens. I think sometimes in wartime, Americans uh, want to cling to whoever's in charge if they're happy with the way that things are going. And here um, we saw FDR win um, a very significant majority of electoral votes and a fairly significant majority of the popular vote, um, even though this was one of his closer elections. Um, but I think what's important through all of this is through these momentous moments, uh, both at the beginning of crises with um, 1860, 1932, um, and then in the midst of them in, 19, in 1864, 1944, you see the American people holding accountable their elected officials. These are, of course, national elections, but also at the state and local level, all these elections are happening. And it's a way for us to continue to have a voice in how it is that our leadership is uh, addressing these crises, which I think is, is a critical um, an important thing. You know, we, we've talked a couple weeks ago, we were talking about uh, private citizens stepping up and volunteering and all the wonderful, beautiful work our healthcare workers are doing. Um, and all that is incredibly important. Um, as important are our political leaders who are guiding our policies and setting, setting out um, how it is that we as a collective community are addressing these things.
Um, and so this process of voting, I think, um, is incredibly popular. And, and as we can see from these elections, and I encourage you to look at the others I highlighted or any others, any other elections that you think are, are interesting from this perspective, um, it, it shows that we as the American people can still come together, um, have our voices heard um, in a process that's, that's trusted um, and that ultimately results in um, us continuing to have a, a stable government, which, which benefits all of us. So let me get this straight. So, so there have been moments of crisis in the United States, like big moments of crisis, right? I mean, they're not, uh, it goes beyond, uh, you know, regional crises. Yep. They're the, the, they, these were national crises that were happening and the elections and the election process did not change, has never been altered or, um, or postponed in our history, right? So it's like been continuously, we've been able to have these elections. Right. Throughout history, there's never been a time, no matter what's been going on in our two, almost 250 years of history, that, that elections just haven't happened or have been significantly postponed. We continue to have them no matter what, because it's such a bedrock of what we do as Americans, as a democratic republic, that, that it is so sacred that it would be unprecedented for us to alter them significantly. Now, in the case of New York City, they are talking right now about changing the date of some of the primary elections um, because of just the nature of what's happening in New York City right now. But that wouldn't be like the national election, we're still pretty secure that the national election is gonna go forward as expected. As far as I'm aware, and and I think, you know, that, that you know, 1860, I think, is a good example of it. I mean, in 1860, there, there, the debate was about slavery, right? And it was about what the country was going to do about slavery. Uh, and that was a, a time when the American people had to make a choice about the direction that was going to go. And ultimately, it was, it was, uh, it, 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 conflict followed that election, but the election itself went forward. And then even within that, as the union was fighting and prosecuting a war to end that institution and, and bring the country back together and preserve the union, um, it continued on that track. And there wasn't, there wasn't, uh, you know, even as Lincoln was taking extreme uh, measures like the suspension of habeas corpus. Um, in fact, Lincoln uh, suspended uh, Maryland's legislature at one point and told them they couldn't meet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, there there was momentous things that were taking place, and yet the national election moved forward. And in my mind, that uh, that gives me hope that in this crisis, we'll also be able to move forward because when America is faced with with challenging times and challenging questions, I think we can find innovative ways to, to continue continue on. Speaking of innovations, uh, the um, it, so one of the things that, again, states like Wisconsin and Minnesota and New York are talking about is trying to move towards mail-in ballots, that everyone is mailed a ballot and they're able to submit uh, that way, there are some concerns about mail-in ballots that are that are real um, with voter fraud or voter access or um, or just being able to legitimize that the people voting actually voted the way they did. But throughout our history, we've had lots of different ways that we've voted, and Gary's put together some some slides to kind of get us talking about all the different ways we have voted in the U.S. Um, so that can put this moment in kind of perspective. Yeah, absolutely. You know, as we talk about things, how much we get excited about history, you know, civics itself is something I get really jazzed about, like the mechanics of just how we do things. Uh, and so to both of your points, this idea that there is this importance, whether or not something tumultuous nationwide is happening, that this process happens, you know, it's a, it's a fundamental part of who we are, but then also started off what you were talking about, Rachel, where, you know, how do you deal with it in situations? You showed us the people lining up and, and with all the distancing happening, you know, are, are they still physically showing up? How are we going to deal with all of this? So for our students out there, whether or not you currently are of voting age or are eligible to vote, it's really important to, to think what is important about voting and then how do we do it? And so that was, that was sort of what I was contemplating. Um, so I was, I was looking through sort of our ideas of how we have voted over time. Um, and it really is, it's a question of what's important, right? And what's important is that an eligible voter 
in the United States has their voice heard. And we have talked about this in terms of, it's not like you get millions of people all descending in one place. We have electors. We have a system where their voice goes to an elector and then those electors in the electoral college um, move on and, and cast their votes. And eventually we have a, a president, let's say, uh, on the national um, on the national forum. So, so just going back, your voice needs to be heard if you can be eligible to do it. Well, before the Revolutionary War, that's exactly how it happened. You would have large groups of people at carnivals or gatherings, and you would just call out, "I vote for this person," and they would, uh, and you know, sort of like a like you would in a classroom, right? That if you're taking a a vocal vote. Um, that's good in some ways, but there's some limitations to that. One, in large numbers, really tough to call out all of those votes verbally. And then two, there's that question of, you know, do, do you want your, your vote to be out there and public, right? Is there something about that that's important? Um, so, so eventually, after the Revolutionary War in early America, of course, um, ballots start uh, happening, where at first you'd have candidates' name and People would sign their names under the, the ballots. And then as populations grew and just the complexity of it, there would be printed ballots. Um, early on, the printed ballots would be given out by the parties um, that told you all the officials that were going to be running. Uh, those eventually got condensed to kind of one ballot in your area that showed you the different parties uh, and everybody that was running. Um, and then that question started coming about in the 19th century of, you know, do we, how public do we make this? Do we put it in a box? Do you, do we have the best pocket ballot? So you would, you know, people would say like, ah, I'm not gonna show you who I'm gonna, who I'm gonna vote for right now. I'm just gonna put it in my pocket and then we'll see what happens with the numbers. Um, and then by 1892, more and more written uh, secret ballots start coming around. By 1920, you see the, the lever machines. That's actually when I was young, I remember. <laughs> the lever machines where you would pick people, put little levers, and then you would, you know, that exciting moment where you would pull the big red bar and then it would, you know, tally your votes. It's, a, it's an early form of a computer. <laughs> um, but then as we showing said- Showing your age, be, Gary, showing your age. Showing my age, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then uh, eventually those led to punch cards by 1965, right? And, and that lasted a really long time. So there are cards that, you know, literally punch holes in them. Um, and then the Voting Rights Act of uh, 1975. And then by 2000, you know, these punch cards came into question. Um, during, uh, during the Bush v. Gore time. Um, and there's been much more move to, do we make it digital? Um, you know, do you fill it out and put it into a computer? And all these questions. Um, but that's what I find really interesting is again, fundamentally what matters and what fundamentally matters, what is the most important thing is that voices are heard and tallied and it's very clear. So um, from the very beginning, from the very first election, this, uh, what I'm showing here is, uh, from the annals of Congress, the first Congress, the first session, and you can see just a little excerpt from from what they, shall we say, journaled, <laughs> from what they had, uh, just tallying that these votes went out, went to electors, and that process worked. And lo and behold, here's a report that our president is going to be a guy named George Washington, uh, and that John Adams is going to be vice president. And that's just the way it is. Um, it, it worked out, those are the numbers, and we accepted that, and we've been doing it ever since. Um, so that's a really interesting question that I'd like to have, right? So um, back to Bush v. Gore, and, and BRI has great resources on the, the Bush-Gore time of 2000. Again, if you were not alive at the time, um, it was a huge deal about how do we know what people's voices were. Right, mm -hmm. and, and this picture was, it was a classic stock photo of this time of saying, what does every American's vote that's going to the electors, what did they intend and how do we know? And so that's the question that I, I would love for you to observe. Um, you're gonna see a lot of stories about, do you have to physically be in person? Do you have to write it down? Do you have to use a card? Should you use a computer? Can you mail it in? Ultimately, what do you think is the best way for an eligible voter voice to be heard? Um, and so, you know, I always like to have us observe what's going on. Take a look maybe this week or this time and observe what's the discussion about voting, about the dates. Does that matter? Does that 
support or go against what fundamentally has to happen. And also, you've seen this has changed over and over again throughout our history. Do you think how we vote is going to change in the future? And if so, what methods of voting do you think would work really well? Because your voice is really important. You, if you're not already, are going to be one of those voters. Um, and it's never too early to just be aware of how voting happens, what's going on in the process, and how it happens is also gonna be something you have the power to influence. So it's a really interesting time to say, what do I see about the way that we vote? Is it fulfilling what we want it to be? And what can I do about it? And I think that's super cool. So that last question is where I'm, I'm, my head is, right? So we have lots of young people who are more tuned into the news now than they probably were six months ago, right? Paying attention to the different, um, the different, as we've said, there's been a lot of um, governors and mayors making declarations. So we're much more attuned to civic life. Maybe you are more attuned to civic life than you were six months ago because it's so present and, and so much a part of, and has such a very, like powerful impact on what you're able to do and not able to do right now. So throughout history, young people have to have, the, the status of young people within civic society and within civil society has shifted, right? So <clears throat> early on, uh, young Americans were given the virgin, their virgin vote is what it was called. And if you're interested in a great book about kind of the history of early American uh, young voters, there's this book called The Virgin Vote by John Grinspan, who uh, out of the Smithsonian, highly recommend it. Um, but there's a lot of um, discussion about what that first vote means and being of eligible voting age and the responsibility that comes with that. Um, and then in the 1960s and 70s with uh, changes in culture and mostly uh, having to do with the, uh, with, with the Vietnam War and the role of young people in society, in 1971, the voting age was lowered to, um, was lowered to 18. And then every year that there's an election, so this is, this is a referendum for New Jersey on presidents for 18 year old vote. Uh, so every year, the 16 year, the question of whether or not a, a 16 year old should be able to vote comes up. The idea being that whoever they're voting for at age 16 will have, or whatever, whatever principles or policies they're voting for at age 16 will have an impact on their 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 taxes their job opportunity by the time they turn 18 so that the mindset there is you want to give people who will be affected by this by the policies by the politicians in power a voice in making in choosing those pol those politicians and the policies in power um and so there's always like so you'll see this every couple of years these articles about how 16 year olds should or shouldn't be able to vote. And, and it's a regular discussion in society. Maybe it's a discussion you have. I'd be curious what you all think. Should 16 year olds be able to vote? That's an interesting question. Um, the other thing, as, as Kirk mentioned, he was saying, we were saying that 80% was really high for voter turnout. Um, this whole period from about 18, 1840 to 1896, that 50 year period had relatively high presidential election turnout. But then you'll see that that it, it really does trail off into the, the 40s and 50s, depending on whether it's a midterm or a presidential election. And then the other thing to note to note is that voter turnout by age varies dramatically. So the people who turn out the most are those who are over age 60 which you hear a lot. And the people who turn out the least are those youth voters, right? The 18 to 29 year olds. I'll make that bigger for you, Kirk. <laughs> there you go, guys. <laughs> um, and so I think that one of the things that we're seeing right now that's, that can be, that, will, that may be profound is your civic, your civic engagement, your awareness of what's happening um, one of the effects that may happen is that you feel more connected to civic activity. And that means that you may feel more compelled to go out and vote because 
there's, there's an opportunity, you feel an opportunity. Now, the thing that at Bill of Rights Institute we talk about all the time is that civic life is not the totality of civil life, right? So what you do in your civic um, duty or your civic engagement is a portion of kind of what makes society good. Right. And so in other episodes, we've talked a lot about how businesses are coming together to support society, how charities are coming together to support society, how individuals are doing all these amazing things. And I think it's important in this episode that we're talking about that our, our, um, our leaders are working really hard to make sure that they're minimizing to the best of their ability the impact of what's happening. And whether that's economic impact or health impact or um, whatever impact is important to their constituents, they're working hard. The, the, the governors and the governor's staff and the, the state legislatures and the national legislature are, are putting in a lot of extra hours right now trying to make sure that Americans are as provided for as, as, as we're able to be given constraints. Did you guys have anything more that you wanted to add? No, I mean, I think that's a really interesting point because I, I also want to stress, you know, we're, we're really talking about voting today and it, it's cool to get really jazzed about it. But I did want to say and agree with you saying, this is important. And if you think back to what I was saying before about the fundamental part of, of what democracy is all about, just because you can't vote maybe doesn't mean you don't have that voice to share. Right. And I think that's really important. And like you said, voting is super important and part of a lot of getting involved in society. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. So I think that was a really interesting idea. Yeah. And as yeah. we think about this moment right now, right? So a lot of attention is going to be paid to the election. Um, I mean, it was already going to be a really contentious election. And the response of whatever is going to happen in the next three to four months is going to really impact what happens in November. November you know, March seemed to last 37 weeks. I don't know. <laughs> I can't even conceive of November coming, but it will. Um, I'm really just looking forward to June, especially because I live in the DC area and that's when we'll be allowed to, to like get out of our houses um, regularly. <laughs> but I think that, that there's gonna be so much discussion that there's this incredible opportunity right now to start building your argument and start building your knowledge base and to start doing the research that will let you be a really well-informed advocate for what you value. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, the importance of issues that were going on before this crisis took place are, are just as important, right? And, and so continue to understand, you know, how, how those things may be impacted, whatever you're passionate about, how that may be impacted by this crisis and, and what candidates are still saying about it, um, as well as how candidates have responded to the crisis or have commentary or criticisms of what's going on during the crisis. I mean, all of that I think is, is really important to pay attention to, as will be just how it is that the election takes place. So how are conventions, for example, gonna take place? Each uh, of the, the major political parties has a convention where they name their nominees. Um, those are gonna, you know, it's gonna be interesting to see how they, how they, how they hold those uh, and how the process of the American people's voice being heard um, actually rings out um, in this election cycle. Absolutely. And if you want to, to kind of see what I think was a really, um, really excellent example of, of, of a state leader speaking to his state, um, if you get a chance to watch the State of the State Address by, Min uh, by Minnesota Governor Tim Waltz, it's one of, those, one of those moments where I have no, I mean, I've been to Minnesota, I think twice in my life, not for very long. I do have a lot of friends there, but it's one of those moments where looking at the rhetoric of how someone chooses to, um, to engage their constituents is really, really interesting. And so comparing and contrasting the different states and how they're responding and what rhetoric they're using. You know, Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York, is, is using very different rhetoric than, than Governor Tim Waltz. And so I think there's an opportunity there to, to find examples and exemplars that you can use for your own life when it comes to thoughts about leadership or public speaking. Um, there's a lot of opportunity to think about right now as, as giving you a lot of examples of what to do and maybe what not to do as you grow into your own, uh, into your own leader in your community. So 
I want to say thank you for your time today and for joining us for another episode of Bright and Early. My name is Rachel. Hi, Gary. Hi. And I'm Kirk, and my dog is Hopper, and he has a lot to say at the moment. So. <laughs> um, and we are here every week to talk about current events and what it means today um, and what it means for history and give you some activities. So please join us again. Let us know if you have anything that you're thinking about, um, any great examples of leadership or not so great examples of leadership that you've seen in your civic leaders and community. Um, and gentlemen, do you have anything more to add? No, exactly. I mean, I think a theme is we'd like to hear from you literally because that's expressing your voice. And so, you know, we want to hear your thoughts. Absolutely. And we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Yep. Thank you, guys. See you Thanks. all soon. Bye. Bye. -bye.